Hi everyone, my name is Ike Rakeski and I work here at Mesa County Libraries. I hope you're doing well today. Thanks for joining us. What we're going to be talking about is a place called Outlaw Mesa. This video is going to look a little bit different than some of the past local history videos in that some of the recording actually took place up on Outlaw Mesa. Um, and then other parts are going to look a lot like what we've got, what we're looking at right now, where it's being recorded over at the 970 West Studio at Mesa County Libraries. Outlaw Mesa is a, a unique and special place that has a lot of deep history here in Mesa County. What I want to do is just look at the, the different facets of what life would have looked like and may, in certain cases, still look like up on Outlaw Mesa. The mining up on Outlaw Mesa was a, a driving force in the history, especially the early history of Outlaw Mesa. We'll talk about the mining. We'll also talk about things like school, what education would have looked like for those young folks, those, those children of the miners and their families who attended school up in a very remote place. We'll also talk about the Foster family. We'll focus a lot on John Pegleg Foster. The Foster family has deep roots up in that area. Um, and, and John Pegleg Foster was one of those earlier explorers that, and we'll talk about this in depth, it was a major influence up there. The mining, you know, I've already mentioned mining when you're, when you're looking at Outlaw Mesa. The mining was extremely important. We know that uranium mining was so important in the history of Mesa County and Montrose County. We'll talk about that. It would almost be, we would almost, in my mind, we would be a little bit remiss if we didn't talk about mining and the Foster's role in that area. Located in Mesa County and to the east of Gateway, Outlaw Mesa is oval shaped and roughly 14 square miles in size. A general land office survey plat from 1902 of the area that was to become Outlaw Mesa shows a prominent landform named Potato Mountain, which is today located very close to Climax Camp, which was a mining camp. Calamity Mesa is named and on that map and it is located to the west of Outlaw Mesa. Other points of interest on that map are a structure labeled Crow's Nest Cabin, which was very close to future uranium mines. Also included are an old Indian trail and an Indian trail. John Peg Lake Foster, who I've already mentioned and we'll be diving, we'll be looking at in more depth here in, here, here in a bit, John Peg Lake Foster is credited with the naming of Outlaw Mesa. There is a decent chance that this map, this 1902 map, is one of the earliest maps of the area that was produced by the United States of America. Other interesting features on the map include the Dolores River Canyon to the west, Maverick Canyon to the west, and Calamity Mesa. According to the May 31st, 1957 issue of the Daily Sentinel, John Foster started the outlaw camp in 1914 after he had discovered a nearby spring. The outlaw camp most likely served to house miners. A 1920 survey lists the area as being the outlaw group. The 1920 map includes a Pickett's Trail, which was built in the early 1900s by a man named Mr. Pickett. Foster and his brothers had discovered rich carnotite deposits on Outlaw Mesa between 1913 and 1960. This discovery of those deposits undoubtedly led to the role of Outlaw Mesa in local mining operations. We're going to shift a little bit and talk about the school that was located on Outlaw Mesa. A October 17, 1954 article in the Daily Sentinel described that the school on Outlaw Mesa would be the most remote and newest school in School District 51. The one-room building allowed for nine students to attend school there. At that point in time, the only faculty consisted of a teacher named Miss Edwina McFarland, 
who had previously taught in another remote location at that time, Cisco, Utah. The article described the mine access roads to the school as being pretty bad at their very best. Prior to the school being built, parents would move to nearby towns during the winter so that their children could attend school. I would say that having this school up on Outlaw Mesa definitely improved the educational opportunities for those children, you know, that they would be able to spend all of the year up where their, their parents were living so that they could get that education. That same issue of the Daily Sentinel included two photos of Miss McFarland teaching students in the school building on Outlaw Mesa. In the first photo, one of the students is speaking about Columbus Day and what the students had learned about that topic. Miss McFarland is pictured in the background on the left side of the photo. The student presenting is Don Liverman, and he is located on the far right side of the image and near the upper corner. The next photo is of Miss McFarland singing Waltzing Matilda while playing the piano in the one room schoolhouse. Waltzing Matilda, Waltzing Matilda, you come a waltzing Matilda. The caption mentioned that the piano had been hauled over rugged roads by truck to the remote mining camp. I can just imagine hauling a piano, you know, it's hard to move when you're in a town and on paved streets, but getting a piano, a large piano, up to Outlaw Mesa, a very remote location, so that it could be in this one-room schoolhouse, I think is a neat little piece of history. I think it also would have brought some, you know, for those folks who lived up there and those children, it would have brought some level of, you know, urban comfort, big city comfort to a very remote place. In September 1959, enrollment at the school consisted of 20 elementary aged students. Another remote and nearby school on Beaver Mesa had 14 students attending at that time. The school at Gateway, which is located west of Outlaw Mesa, was attended by 72 students. In 1960, residents on Outlaw Mesa and Beaver Mesa could make use of our very own Mesa County Library's branch locations at both of those areas. Students at the school were also bussed in from all across the nearby Calamity Mesa. And as the population grew and en enrollment increased, the school eventually served grades from one through eight. The school also became a hub for other non-academic activities, such as movie showings and church services. As the school continued to grow in size, it required a larger building and it was eventually moved to a Quonset hut, which featured running water and electricity. The school also served as the Mesa County polling place in 1956, and was likely, I'd say there's a very good chance that it was the polling place for the area during other years. Other groups would also make use of the mining camps on Outlaw Mesa. The Daily Sentinel issue from September 26, 1949, mentioned that 50 employees and guests of the Minerals and Engineering and United States Geodetic Survey groups held a picnic that Friday night at Outlaw Camp. The evening's entertainment included songs and stories around a campfire. Moving on to that next facet of history and life on Outlaw Mesa, we're now gonna be talking about the mining up there. The mining was incredibly important as I've mentioned. There were references made to both an outlaw camp and Foster's camp on Outlaw Mesa. Today, the major remains of mining activity on Outlaw Mesa are at Climax Camp. Most of the mining on Outlaw Mesa took place prior to 1960. Outlaw Mesa was the home of a lot of uranium mining, but not just uranium mining, there was also radium mining and vanadium mining. Um, we're in a beautiful location. We're actually at a ghost town 
called Climax Camp. And Climax was a mining camp dedicated to uranium, vanadium, and radium mining. There was a 1903 map, um, that's the earliest that I've been able to find. It doesn't say Outlaw Mesa, although it does indicate Calamity Mesa, which is just a little bit this direction. The 1903 map does not include any locations of mines themselves. However, the 1903 map does show a potato mountain and potato mountain is actually off in this direction. Like I said, we don't have any mining camps. We don't have any mines on that 1903 map. However, just to the north of Potato Mountain, there is a cabin indicated, and that cabin is listed as Crow's Nest Cabin. You've got that cabin. There's also a number of Native American trails that are shown on that map. You'll see those trails just north of here, and then you'll also see other trails called the Native American trails or Ute trails. The earliest mining activity involved extracting radium from carnitite ore from small mines on the northwest end of the mesa overlooking Calamity Gulch. This next slide shows us a, a map. This early radium mining would have taken place in the area towards the center of the image. Calamity Gulch runs from the left center towards the lower left-hand corner. The Climax Uranium Company focused its mining operations in the area of Calamity Mesa and Outlaw Mesa. The company maintained modern camps on both of those areas. Single miners were supplied with room and board while couples typically brought their own trailers to the camps. The community of miners and their families became tightly bonded units, which probably had to do with the remoteness of the camps. Different social groups were also formed, including social clubs for women and Sunday school. Almost undoubtedly, individuals and families would have needed to rely on one another at times and provide a support network for others on Outlaw Mesa. So I am standing in front of what looks a lot like a root cellar here at the camp. Makes me think about how hardy these folks would have been who lived up here. You know, Grand Junction is, I don't know, hour and a half, maybe two hours away from here. But those families and those miners who were living up here would have had to be quite self-reliant. You talk about terms like subsistence and families being able to survive out here and maybe only going in for groceries in a Grand Junction every once in a while. Maybe it was every week, maybe it was every two weeks. Either way, to live up at a camp like this, you would have had to be in, you know, very self-reliant, hardy, um, hardworking, and, um, be comfortable with living on the frontier, especially in those early days. If someone's truck or car had a flat tire in such a far-flung area, it could have been highly impactful to the quality of life if others had not been willing to lend a hand or help out in other ways would have been a very self-sustaining community up there. The men, women, and children who lived and worked on Outlaw Mesa were hardworking, community-minded, and hardy individuals who knew how to make a living in a beautiful, but at times, harsh environment. One of the several mines on Outlaw Mesa was the G1 mine. And the G1 mine was a large producer of uranium ore. Beginning in 1950 and continuing for over six years, the mine consistently produced more than 1,000 tons of ore each month. And at certain times, it produced over 2,000 tons. The mine was part of the salt wash mines, which is a member of the Upper Jurassic Morrison Geological Formation. The mine was one of the few members of the salt wash layer that produced over 100,000 wet tons of uranium and vanadium ore. 
The G1 mine was managed from the Outlaw Mesa field camp, and it was located on the north end of Outlaw Mesa. This next slide is a section of the map showing the location of the G1 mine and its location on Outlaw Mesa and in relation to Gateway towards the west. The similarly named G2 mine was located about one mile southeast of Climax Camp. The Daily Sentinel issue from April 3rd, 1949 reported that the Minerals Engineering Company was carrying on extensive diamond drilling operations for both the company itself and for the Atomic Energy Commission. In spite of the reported poor weather on Outlaw Mesa, the company was continuing to carry a full workforce. An article from April 21st, 1950 in the Daily Sentinel, it was reported that, a multi, that the multi-million dollar Climax Molybdenum company would soon be entering the vanadium and uranium business, and that ore for the company's planned mill in Grand Junction would most likely be from a handful of claims, including Outlaw Mesa and Calamity Mesa. At the time of that article, the location of the Climax mill was yet to be determined, although it would eventually be constructed at the site of the original Holly Sugar Beet factory in Grand Junction. This next slide is showing us representatives of the Denver Chamber of Commerce on a tour of mines on Outlaw Mesa, which was organized and led by the Grand Junction Chamber of Commerce. The caption mentions that a good number of the attendees brought home pieces of carnotite ore from the trip. There's a decent chance that this next photo is from that same tour. The image was taken inside the, inside the 165 foot deep G1 mine on Outlaw Mesa. A Climax mine official is the gentleman wearing the dark hat towards the left center of the image. This next photo is a historic photo of the Outlaw Mesa camp, which might have been a different camp than the Climax camp or Foster's camp. The photo is from around 1957. Here's another photo of Outlaw Mesa from a different perspective showing different landforms on the horizon. See, there is a decent chance that this is from the same time period as that previous image. This next photo is of two men, R.D. Graham, who was a maintenance foreman, and G.K. Bernhardt, who was a maintenance specialist. These two men were employees of the Climax Uranium Company and may have worked at mines on Outlaw Mesa. The next slide shows three men who worked at the Outlaw Mesa mines. Right to left, their names are listed as F.C. Harvey, who was a lead man, E.A. Roberts, who was a foreman, and G.H. Clark, who was a master mechanic. Early mining camps on Outlaw Mesa and the surrounding areas may have looked similar to these camps, which were located in Paradox Valley, Colorado. So the next topic that I'm gonna talk about for a couple minutes is the already mentioned Foster family. The role of the Foster family on Outlaw Mesa was highly influential, and although Carnotite might have been mined in the area, if the Fosters had not been involved, the operations likely would not have looked the same and the Mesa would not have gained the memorable name that it did. Pegleg Foster began mining carnotite ore on Outlaw Mesa and Calamity Mesa in 1915. His brothers Julius and Russell and his teenage son Ralph worked along with him during the radium boom. The Foster family remained intensely involved in mining in the communities in the area for decades up until 1988. Peg Lake Foster was born on November 12, 1881 in Shelby County, Iowa, and he came to Colorado with his parents in 1890. Robert and Marjorie Foster, along with their relatives, mined from the early 1940s through the early 1980s. They would transport the ore that they mined to mills in the towns of Western Colorado, including Rifle and Grand Junction. 
The school was located close to the family compound, which became a central hub for miners in the area. Peg Legg's son, Ralph, left Outlaw Mesa for a time, but returned in the early 1920s with his young son, Robert. Members of the Foster family would leave the Mesa at times, but across generations of that family, deep ties were maintained and they remained an integral part of that area. Peg Legg Foster would continue to prospect in Western Colorado until he was 78 years old. He was also featured in Al Look's book titled, Unforgettable Characters of Western Colorado, The Hell That Was Paradox by Howard Greger in several newspaper articles. So I'm standing in front of one of the buildings at Climax Camp. On Outlaw Mesa, there was Climax Camp, there was also Outlaw Camp and Foster's Camp. It's one of those things where historical records might have some blurred lines or gray areas. There are other camps in this area. Um, in fact, just to the south of here a little bit, there are some additional buildings. Uranium mining and radium and vanadium mining were such a big deal here in this section of Western Colorado, Mesa County and Montrose County, that you're gonna find camps spread out throughout the Uncompagre Plateau. Climax Camp being one of those. Calamity Camp, which is located a couple miles from here, was also a mining camp. The interesting thing about Calamity Camp is it's actually on the National Register of Historic Places, whereas some of these other camps are not. You might think about the name Climax Camp and think about where did it get that name. There's most likely a connection to the Climax Mining Company, which was all over the state of Colorado. Going back into the history of Grand Junction, there's also the Climax Uranium Mill, close to, which was located close to downtown Grand Junction. You look at names like Calamity, Climax Camp, Shumway's Camp, those are quite colorful. There's also another camp called Angel's Landing. In addition to that, there was Hieroglyphic Camp, Thunderbolt Camp, Shamrock Camp, Julian Camp, goes on and on. Um, all very colorful, colorful mining camp names. Climax Camp, these buildings on Climax Camp are actually quite well preserved given the fact that they've been out here exposed to the elements for a very, very long time. At Climax Camp, there are a number of structures remaining, probably five or seven. We are standing right next to, or I should say I'm standing right ne next to a cement stoop. You can see the stoop right here to my right. However, we're not seeing that building. It was associated with the stoop. At Climax Camp, there was actually a schoolhouse and there's probably were other structures that were here that are no longer standing. In addition to Climax Camp, some of those other camps that I mentioned there might have been more buildings or less buildings. Some of those camps could very well have been just one or two cabins or possibly a line shack or maybe even Quonset huts. It all depends on how much they developed those camps, whether the mining was extensive at those camps or more extensive or less extensive. Um, there's, I'd say, some different variability within those camps. Some of those camps that I mentioned, whether it's Thunderbolt Camp or Hieroglyphic Camp, may not even be findable nowadays. They're not gonna be like Climax Camp where you can actually see these buildings. There might just be faint remnants of those camps. Um, the stoop though, we don't know. It could have been that schoolhouse, it could have been another cabin or structure that was associated with it. So to the left of me are some remains of an orchard. And it makes me think about 
some of the food that the families and the miners up here would have subsisted upon. I'm sure that in a lot of cases they would have used this fruit that they'd grown up here. I'm also sure that they would have grown vegetables, possibly gardens up here as well. In addition to that, in addition to growing their own food, I'm sure that hunting would have also came into play. You know, up here on the Uncompahgre Plateau, it's a natural and prime area for both deer and elk. And I'm sure that hunting was another form of subsistence for those families and those individuals. The next section that I'm gonna talk about for a couple minutes is just some other snapshots of life for both people who lived on Outlaw Mesa or have been traveling up to Outlaw Mesa for you know, certain activities, whether it was recreational or to be visiting family or friends up there. A January 12, 1963 article in the Daily Sentinel described a family that made trips from Outlaw Mesa to Grand Junction twice a month to purchase supplies and groceries and that the remoteness of Outlaw Mesa undoubtedly affected others as well. In March of 1973, two men who were out hunting for rocks ran out of gas on Outlaw Mesa near Carson's Hole. They built a fire, spent the night, and then walked down to lower elevations the next morning where they, when they ran into a Mesa County Road Department crew who brought them home. Three different parties had been searching for the two men, and what added to the difficulty was that nobody was really aware of the two men's location. The areas that they had been thought to be visiting were the Grand Mesa or Cisco, Utah. After the men were safely found, Mesa County Under Sheriff Hod Hutchison was quoted as giving the following advice to visitors on Outlaw Mesa and other backcountry areas. He said, and take plenty of gas. Looking back to prehistoric times, prior to the late 1800s, the area which would become Outlaw Mesa had been a place where Native Americans had lived, worked, and raised families for thousands of years. Several prehistoric sites in the nearby area and larger regions serve as evidence of this. One piece of such evidence was a partial projectile point that a man named Dale Wozner found on Outlet Mesa in 1971. It is possible that that projectile point was from the Folsom culture, which dates back, which dates back to 12,000 to 13,000 years all across Colorado. An article in the Daily Sentinel issue on September 19th, 1971, describes Wozner's finding of the point two weeks prior. Wozner felt that his amateur archeological status did not warrant his analysis of the point, and he gave information on the point and, its, and it to others who were more knowledgeable on the subject. Possible supporting evidence that the point was from the Folsom culture came from the fact that three Folsom finds had been examined earlier in the region from that same culture. The first such find was made by professional archeologist Harold Husher in the 1930s. If Wozner's find was a genuine Folsom point, it was an important one as Folsom artifacts are rare in Colorado with the exception of major excavation sites. I just wanna take a, a minute or two and talk about visiting our public lands with respect. Do not collect historic or prehistoric artifacts and do not vandalize historic or prehistoric structures and sites. It is illegal to alter or damage archeological sites on public land. Help protect the natural beauty of your public lands by properly disposing of litter. Keep in mind that other people might be, might be visiting public lands for peace and solitude. Be aware of how loud you are talking. Public land is also the natural home of many varieties of mammals, fish, insects, and birds. Avoid disturbing them by viewing them from a distance. 
drive or ride only on designated roads and trails. Do not drive cross country. I would like to also acknowledge, and Mesa County Libraries would also like to acknowledge, that parts of this video were filmed on public land managed by the BLM Grand Junction Field Office. Thanks for joining me. I hope this was a, a, an interesting and, and educational look at a very interesting and neat place, Outlaw Mesa. Thanks.